So hi, everyone. Welcome to our session today. Um, we're really thrilled to have you all here with us. Um, I'm really excited to uh, introduce and kick off this series uh, with Regina Gong. Um, we're going to, the way this is going to go is we're going to have uh, some time to hear Regina's story of how she has uh, adopted and led OER in the state of Michigan. And then we'll have ample time for discussion afterwards. So in the meantime, while you're listening to Regina's story, uh, feel free to use the chat to share any questions or comments and I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll make sure to address all of your questions as we open it up for discussion at the end of the session. Um, so just quickly a little bit about myself. My name is Megan Simmons. I run the training and design program here at ISKME and that includes our OER professional learning program. Uh, so that's all of the trainings and workshops and events uh, that we do to support OER adoption uh, and leadership throughout the US and also internationally. And I know we have a couple folks uh, from um, other countries. So I wanna welcome you all uh, to the session today. Um, and all of this is uh, a part of our um, OER Commons digital library that we have and launched um, a little over 10 years ago. And uh, we have lots of tools and uh, services to support OER adoption and, um, and access. So um, really thrilled to offer this series as part of our training and, and advocacy work. And uh, over the years, uh, let's see, I, I wanna say for 10 years or so, we've been working with different states to really help them think about and roadmap and uh, lead OER adoption and advocacy uh, in, their, in their states, across their states. And more and more now with initiatives like Go Open from the Department of Education in the US, uh, we're getting contacted from folks that say, oh, I'd love to hear a story from a different state. And I'd love to hear uh, how other leaders tackled some of these challenges and, and questions that we're addressing. And as we receive more and more of these requests, we thought, oh, this would be a great uh, offering for our next storytelling series uh, and, and webinar series. And we like to offer uh, webinars as a way to connect and keep the conversations going with different leaders and, and inspiring work that we see across the field of, of OER and open educational practice. So um, with all these requests, we started just kind of brainstorming as a team, uh, you know, who might be good to, to share and, and highlight and showcase uh, their, their process and their work. And uh, we had a long list of names and I'm sure there are folks here too that, um, you know, have great stories to share and would love to hear that. Um, but we ended up identifying five wonderful leaders from different states to uh, showcase in this first series. And we've received so much interest that uh, I think we're gonna offer more. So if you know of other folks that we should reach out to, please let us know. Um, but really the intention here is to uh, really showcase some of these great leadership voices uh, that we're seeing across the field of OER and really celebrate their success and learn their plans for the future. So these are folks that have been, you know, working in the field of OER for, for a couple years now. And um, we also wanted to really, you know, hear how they got started, how they began their OER journey, how they determined their goals and priorities and address different challenges that they encountered. And uh, we're so impressed uh, and inspired by these leaders uh, when we reached out to them and said, you know, would you be interested in this? And all of them that we reached out to resoundingly said, yes, we'd love to share our stories and, you know, be honest about, <laughs> you know, this, this work and, and that, you know, it can be challenging at times and, and the wonderful rewards that come along with that and the great impact and value add that, that they're making across their states. Um, so uh, I'm really excited to introduce Regina. She's someone that I feel like I've met in person, but <laughs> when we when we first chatted on the phone, I realized, oh my gosh, I just know you through, you know, your your great work and 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 really strong social media presence. Um, but Regina's doing some really impressive work in the state of Michigan, and one of the things that I really love about Regina's story 
is, um, you know, that she's a librarian and we're seeing more and more that librarians are some of the biggest assets that schools and states and districts have um, for OER leadership and advocacy. And um, I think she's really gone beyond <laughs> the role of, of a librarian, um, which is really exciting because, you know, within this digital age, we're seeing librarians really reimagine what it is to be a librarian. And I think Regina is a really inspiring example of what that is. And uh, I first got to know Regina through social media. She's super active. She goes to a lot of conferences and presents a lot. And I, I have a feeling she's a social butterfly. I've never seen her in action, but I can't wait to. Um, but then I, I saw her um, in one of the projects that we're doing with Michigan Colleges Online which is um, a consortium of 28 community colleges across the state of Michigan that are collaborating in a hub space in OER Commons to create and share high quality OER. And she really stood out as somebody who's doing some great work and not only really supporting her community college, which is Lansing Community College, but how is she supporting other community colleges across the state? And as I've learned in, in, in my conversations with Regina, she's also supporting um, higher ed universities across uh, Michigan as well, and has dreams to really impact K-12 too. So she's, you know, she's at this community college level, but she really is working K through, through higher ed. So um, really exciting uh, to see what she's doing there. And um, I mean, her, her, one of her job titles is librarian and OER project manager for Lansing Community College. But she's also, um, in addition to you know, her great presence on social media and all this advocacy work she's doing across the state, she is an open education research fellow. And she's also on the program committee for the Open Ed Conference of 2018. So she's a busy lady <laughs> and we're really uh, honored to have her with us here today and excited to hear her story. And um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Regina. And uh, Regina is gonna speak for around 20 minutes and then uh, we'll open it up for discussion. So please feel free to share any questions or comments in the chat as, as Regina kicks it off. So thanks so much, Regina, and uh, feel free to take it away. Well, thank you so much, um, Megan, for that wonderful introduction. And welcome, everyone, no matter where you are. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> so I am so glad to kick off um, Open Ed Week, um, this webinar series from IXME. And um, like what I said um, to Megan, I am just here to tell you a story. So and hopefully at the end of my my uh, presentation will be able to to talk and converse and um, just learn from each other so um, I will start by okay let's let's see uh, okay so I will start by introducing you to Lansing Community College um, this are this is our campus actually when it's not winter when it's sunny and warm this is um, how our campuses. Um, we are located in downtown Lansing. Um, we are in mid-Michigan. So um, if you are looking at the, you know, the mitten that is the shape of Michigan's um, map, we're in the middle. Um, we are 61 years old. We were founded in 1957. And um, as a community college here in Michigan, we are the third largest, which um, we have about 26,000 students enrolled per year. And we offer um, more than 200 degree and certificate programs. For those of you who, are, um, who may not be familiar with um, the mission of community colleges, um, just you know, want to remind you that um, Community colleges are the only institution of higher education that practices open enrollment. We, do, we don't turn students away because we are an open access institution. And here in the US, there's about 12.3 million students enrolled in community colleges, um, which represents about 45% of all um, undergraduate students in higher education. Um, so, 
it's uh, it actually began my story in 2014. So that was the year when I started um, learning about open education. So when I, it started when I first heard um, David Wiley's TEDx talk. So it is really interesting because he talked about open education and it was the first time that I've um, heard him talk about the idea of education as sharing. Of course, I'm a librarian. Um, I'm all for, you know, sharing and um, having free and equitable access to information. But I was really inspired by David because he operationalized the concept of openness, the idea that um, open education are acts of generosity, acts of sharing and giving, and that um, the more open we are, the better education would be. So that really was, was an inspiration for me. And then um, around that same year too, in 2014, I attended Charleston Conference. And I, um, I heard Nicole Allen. So she is from Spark and where she talks about the changing role of um, libraries in terms of providing um, content to our students beyond course reserves. Um, at that same conference, I was able to talk to Marilyn Billings of UMass Amherst, who at the time is already starting with their textbook affordability campaign. Um, Cybir, Cy, Cybil, Cybil Oberlander of um, SUNY OER um, Services was also there, and he talked about the many good things that they've been doing in SUNY. And so that really inspired me to learn more about this thing called open educational resources. So um, like anything that um, I want to learn. So, you know, I read up on a lot of things OER. I attended a lot of webinars, uh, mostly from CCC OER. I read a lot of research from the open education group and also um, read a lot of blogs, followed a lot of uh, open educators on Twitter, and really expanded uh, my network to include open education. And um, because I'm an academic librarian, um, I set out to create an OER LibGuide to start with. So um, it was also around the time when LCC um, was doing a new strategic plan. We had a new provo at the time, and um, we were embarking on um, a three-year strategic planning um, session. And so at the time, there was one area where I thought OER can fit really well because aside from um, the strategic plan, the, the college is also talking a lot about textbook affordability. Just because our students are complaining that they cannot afford to buy um, this costly textbook. And to me, the only solution would be to introduce um, OER as an, as an initiative. And so um, I pitched in OER as part of uh, the projects in our um, strategic plan. And the chair of the um, committee said that since it was my idea, I should lead it. And so I, I became the, the, you know, the leader of that uh, particular initiative. And so um, what I did was actually planting the seed, the seed of awareness um, on campus to every stakeholder. So administration, faculty, certainly, librarians, staff, and students. It was seed, it was like, you know, seed after seed of um, OER planted on the ground and I was just hoping that um, some of the seeds will germinate and grow. Um, and I think for those of you who um, are leading or thinking of um, doing an OER initiative campus-wide, the thing that we really need to do is to, to invest a lot in awareness and training because we cannot sell 
what they don't know. So um, during our initial foray into our OER initiative, there were really lots of trainings, work shops and other professional development geared towards faculty so that they get a clear understanding of OER, of OER and how they can use it in their courses. So I have been doing a lot of faculty trainings um, around that time, late fall 2014 and early 2015. But I think and I felt at the time that an outside voice is needed, especially those voices of experts that would um, amplify the message that I have been communicating to our faculty and other stakeholders, but also hopeful, hopefully inspire, inspire them to move um, and try OER. And so I set up a very ambitious plan of uh, bringing together all these leading OER um, figures to LCC, um, not just college-wide, but to also open it up to um, our other colleagues here in Michigan, particularly um, our other community college colleges. Um, there's 28 eight of us here in Michigan, and also open it up to our four-year um, universities and research libraries here in Michigan as well. And we were able to do that because our, our administration general, generously funded um, the, the mounting of the summit. And so I was able to invite them all for free. And that was in September 2015. So this is just some of the pictures that um, you'll see from that first OER summit. We had David Wiley as our keynote speaker, Nicole Allen, um, Nicole Finkbeiner, um, who did uh, the morning sessions, kind of setting the stage for what OER, open education, and the crisis in um, the textbook industry that precipitated uh, the rise of OER. And then afternoon was a workshop facilitated by Una from CCC OER, um, Quill, Lisa, and Preston. So this is the afternoon workshop. It was attended by about 220 um, people from Michigan um, community colleges and um, here at LCC as well. So just some of the pictures. And of course, that was the first time I was able to meet um, David in person. So I was really so happy that he was able to come in here in Michigan to talk about OER. And true enough, after that um, summit, we really got um, a lot of good response, not just from our um, faculty, but um, our other colleagues in um, the community colleges and um, universities as well. Um, a lot of our faculty uh, were now um, considering using OER for their courses, but because at the time um, it was already way into our fall semester, they were not able to um, do the adoption. However, um, there were um, a few faculty who did um, pilot OER in their classes for fall 2015. Um, we started with about five faculty teaching in five courses using OER. So that was our pilot um, semester in fall 2015. So while it is a movement that I led, I think it became a success because of our faculty champions and I could never have done it without them. Um, they, they didn't come all at once. It was one at a time, just like the, snowf uh, the snowflakes you see here. And it kind of snowballed into a movement, which you would see um, later on as I um, go on with our story. So I um, just want to show you like the progression from where we started in fall 2015 up to fall 2016, which is um, a year of implementation. We had five courses using OER in 11 sections. And by the time fall 2016 came, we had 14 um, courses using OER in 101 um, sections. 
And so from five faculty in fall 2015, um, in fall 2016, we had 46 faculty using OER. And these are the number of students enrolled in those um, OER um, classes or courses. And so with the success of that first OER summit, we followed it up with another um, OER summit um, that was held last um, year. And um, we had Gable Green of um, Creative Commons as our keynote speaker. So again, um, this is not only um, an LCC event, but I opened it up to um, our other um, colleagues in uh, community college here and also partnered with, so this one is our faculty um, workshop in the afternoon. Just wanted to show you that we also invite our colleagues from the K-12 to because Michigan is a go open state and so we we also would like to highlight the work that they've been doing in the K-12 to sector so they were also part of of that um, summit and then because of the success of the summit that we've been um, holding here at LCC the MCO Michigan Colleges Online OER Steering Committee decided to do its first ever Michigan OER Summit so that was um, last year in September and we had Dr. Robin DeRosa as our keynote she actually talked about um, open pedagogy and open educational practices, which a lot of our faculty really found very um, inspirational. And so I showed you the figures before, one year after we started. So now, you know, just get the whole flavor of um, how we are so far. So as you can see, um, now in spring 2018, we have 26 courses using OER representing 154 sections. And from five faculty in fall 2015, we now have 75 faculty using OER in their courses. And then, um, okay, what, okay, so this is the total textbook savings that we have realized out of this. And we use the $100 per student as a multiplier. So as you can see from the time we started in fall 2015 up to this semester, we have saved $1.5 million in textbook costs for our students. And our students love it. Um, every semester we do um, a feedback survey and the, the responses that they give to us is short of life changing. It's like, it's a, it really has changed their life, you know, with their with their um, instructor providing this um, free and openly licensed materials, so that they don't have to worry about buying these expensive textbooks, and they have it from day one of the class, and they say that um, you know they really appreciate that um, that we care for them. So. I think that the most important um, thing for me as a leader here in my campus is to have a vision. So my vision, you know, the ultimate goal is really to help our students be successful, to remove the barrier of um, high textbook costs for them, and at the same time to empower our faculty. And I think to a certain extent, we have achieved that. But the thing is, I think a leader also needs to communicate that vision and take the people along with them so that you can collectively um, implement that vision and work towards accomplishing your goals. And um, what I'm saying is that the road, the road towards that is not paved like, like this road here. You know, it certainly is not as smooth and not as straight as, as you can see. You know, we've encountered a lot of uh, bumps, twists, and turns um, along the way. But the important thing is um, we learn from it and we are working to make it better. So we are really moving at a very fast pace. Um, our president has a goal of um, having 50% of the 
of courses at LCCU's OER. I don't know if we can accomplish that or um, how long it will take us to get there, but what I do know is that um, while our OER uh, initiatives stemmed from the ground up, we also have a very strong top to bottom support from our college administration. And we, I think that bottom up, top down you, is, is really important because if you don't have that support from um, administration, I don't think you would be able to um, go any further. So when I say support, you know, um, support in terms of um, professional development, in terms of um, giving uh, grants or incentive faculty for um, turning their courses into OER. And I am fortunate because we have that perfect combination here in my college. And um, speaking of um, support from the top, um, because we have been advocating um, for our faculty to be compensated, because remember, up to, the po up to this point, um, we don't have any um, faculty grants or incentives um, to help our faculty turn their courses into OER. And to my mind, I think that our next step in order to scale um, OER adoption even more is to provide this um, to our faculty. And so um, in September um, 2017, our board of trustees approved a $500,000 allocation so that we can use this uh, money to um, help our faculty uh, turn their courses into OER. So of course it is through an award program. The amount of money tied into the award is um, dependent upon the level of engagement that a faculty is going to do with OER. So um, it's from $200 to $3,000 and it's in three categories. Um, adoption, revised remix, and creation and development of new OER. So we are actually in our third round of um, faculty uh, awards. So the first round, we awarded 28 faculty in 15 courses. Um, this is for implementation in fall 2018 semester. And then um, in round two, which just um, ended, we awarded 40 faculty in 14 courses. Um, and for the second round, this would be for spring 2019 implementation. So in total, we have 68 faculty working on um, different types of um, OER work for um, 29 courses. And the call for the third round is open. And I think our deadline for that would be April. So with this um, OER award, we are projecting an additional savings of $1.6 million in a span of one academic year. And I think with the rate that we are going, we are um, on track to achieving our $5 million um, goal for, um, by, by fall 2019. And, um, I cannot stress the importance of um, social media, um, especially if you are working in um, the open education world. Um, in particular, Twitter, because it has really helped me a lot. Um, it has helped me amplify our message and tap into this amazing, amazing personal learning network that I can tap on for anything. And um, I learned from the many um, different people that I follow. And um, it also allows me to engage with um, these open educators, not just here in the US, but really globally. And so, you know, I, I, I am really thankful for, for the, the chance that I've been able to um, affect in terms of my social media presence. And these are just some of the people that I've followed that have been such a good source of inspiration, um, good source of uh, advice, support, and anything that, um, you know, I needed to, um, you know, help me as I work in this area of OER and open education. 
And so this is actually my last slide. Um, I'd just like to conclude by saying that our story is still unfolding. You know, we don't have a the end to this story because there's still so much more to do and so much more to learn. Um, you know, we're always used to um, taking from people who have generously shared their work and their knowledge by openly licensing their work. So it is our turn and I feel um, it is our turn to contribute to that um, open community by um, giving back through the work that our faculty um, are doing um, with OER. Um, and personally, I still have a lot more to learn and to discover um, in my fellowship. Um, through the Open Education Group, I am learning a lot about um, how our OER project has really affected our students, not just with their grades, but whether we are retaining our students, are our students persisting, are our students learning. So that is part of the research that I'm doing. We are writing that um, that paper now and hopefully we'll have that published soon. But what I am saying is that with this um, OER initiative, we are not harming our students. So in terms of like, um, you know, they're learning. So um, yeah, that, that's all. And, and like, um, just one more thing with our next steps. We have just um, signed uh, an agreement, a partnership with Lumen Learning to help um, specifically our math faculty transition their courses to OER. Um, other universities here in Michigan are also looking at us for advice, in particular Michigan State University, who is also launched, you know, they're also launching their own OER award um, grant on campus and um, trying to learn from what we have learned um, with our um, OER award uh, project here. And of course, still partnering with our colleagues from the K to 12 um, through our Go Open initiative. So that's it. I look forward to your questions and to our discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Regina, and congratulations on all of your success and hard work. I know um, it's not always easy, but you certainly have seen some real impact and value add to your community. So um, it's really great to see. Um, one thing, I, I see some questions popping up in chat that we'll get to, and please, uh, anyone feel free to add a question there, and I'll, I'll share those with Regina to uh, address. Um, one thing that I'm curious about that, you know, connects a lot to my work is faculty motivation. <laughs> okay. And you said that you started with those five faculty and now it's spread to 75. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could just share any recommendations or things to consider in terms of motivating faculty. And I mean, we encounter a lot that there's probably a handful of folks that are really intrinsically motivated to do yeah. this. Maybe they're already doing some form of open educational practice. They might not even call it that mm -hmm. uh, in, their, in, their, in their existing practice. But what, what, what recommendations do you have in terms of really, um, you know, motivating the faculty and actually getting them to on board to, to do this work? Yeah. I think the, the most effective way that I found is by the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the one-on-one -on -one interaction with faculty. Um, I do a lot of meetings with them. Um, I attend a lot of program faculty meetings. So the thing about that is um, when we started our OER initiative, we have, we know who are our targets? So we are targeting the first, um, the top 10 um, high enrollment courses for which there is already a quality and a stable um, OER presence. So um, I think that helps because then you know that, um, you know, you have a target. Say, for example, um, our English 121, which is our Composition 1 um, uh, course. That's like a high enrollment, multi-section course. And there's a really stable um, OER uh, 
you know, in, in that area. And so, you know, I, I do a lot of reaching out to this faculty. Um, our psych 200, which is the intro to psychology, is also one of our top um, high enrollment courses. Um, I work with their program chair one-on-one -on -one, and then, um, you know, had a lot of meetings with their faculty. It's just, I really don't, um, I think the key here is to just let them know what their options are without, um, without mandating, you know, it's like, okay, do you know that, um, there's this, um, you know, OER, I'll give them like my strategies. I always give them, um, a menu so that they can choose from it. So it's like a buffet. I lay it out to them if there's like, 10 probable um, OER in their area that they can choose from, then it's up to them to choose. And when they finally choose it, then I come in again to, uh, you know, to support them. So a lot of times I think it's just um, educating faculty um, about the benefits and advantages of um, using an OER. And certainly if they don't feel like an OER would best serve their students, I, I don't force it on them. So, yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Susan had a great question in terms of how resources are packaged and presented or shared with the students. Do you have a mm -hmm. sense of, of that? Uh, delivery um, or I mean, it might be different across courses but yes yes um, yeah because I work with faculty a lot not just in their adoption but the after so the publishing um, we don't have a formal publishing but um, say for example let me let me take a look I, I wish I can share my screen so for example um, one of our faculty here who created his um, own intro to logic and critical thinking um, textbook. So that one, um, that one, we deposited it in OER Commons. Um, it's an open textbook library. And if our student would like to get a print um, copy of that, we have it um, set up in lulu.com so that our students can uh, purchase the print copy of that material for like five dollars five point seventy three dollars um and so for example our open stacks um adoptions our students can have the option of buying the print either in amazon or in our third party online bookstore and we also made it easy for our students to print if they want to print so they can just print off of their print credits but then uh, based from our um, survey so we do a survey every um, semester um, two surveys one for students and one for faculty and um, you know semester after semester it always is consistent only 10 percent of our students print either you know download the chapter or download the entire book um but then we don't want to disadvantage those people who still want to, to print so we we provide them an option um to print as well and we have and i i've got to show we also have um an open learning open learning lab which is essentially a wordpress um site that we have built to enable our faculty to um, have their own pages. LCC is also a domain of one's own institution, meaning um, our faculty can have their own um, website through WordPress and um, as well as our students. So um, that is still something that you know is our to do because my 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 goal is to have a robust oer publishing platform that um, we can have here at at lcc and certainly with our partnership with our open learning lab led by one of our faculty um you know we're working to make that happen that's great i hope i answered the question <laughs> we'll see susan let us know. <laughs> i think that was pretty thorough that was great yeah um, and yeah, folks, feel free to to add your your questions in chat. Um, what you know, one thing that um, 
I know, you know, as, as states are, are looking, um, you know, to, to get started on these journeys, they, there's a lot of considerations around who should be involved in those initial planning and road mapping discussions. Um, do you have any recommendations for folks in terms of like who should be on board? I mean, your use case is so unique in that, you know, it's really librarian led, but maybe mm -hmm. some of the folks on the call are representing um, admin or, you know, policy folks or researchers mm -hmm. or faculty. Uh, who do you think should be involved in those initial planning discussions to, to really get OER initiatives off the ground? I, I think all of those people who you mentioned, you know, it has to be a cross section of, of the campus um, leadership. So you need to have um, representation, certainly from the library, um, you know, faculty champions, instructional designers are very important too, um, to be part of, of this initiative because um, especially with um, the integration with your LMS, um, you know, we we have um, our our instructional designers, librarians, faculty, academic senate is also a very important ally. If you have an academic senate in your institution, um, of course, our initial administration champion was our provo. Um, he really was very, very supportive. Um, and then our, um, your center for um, student access or your, um, because you know, accessibility is important. So you need to have them part of it. Um, we have, um, if you have student success coaches, uh, people in advising, so student services, center for teaching excellence, and um, the people who are managing your um, LMS, you know, and IT. IT is also important to be part of that um, cross-section committee, so. That's great. And what about, I know, you know, we have some faculty and, and program directors here and, and, and folks that are yes. trying to you know, incentivize people. And one thing we hear more and more is time is the is is a real barrier that you know people just can't find the time and it seems like at lansing community college you all have been able to find the time to make it work what what do you have to say <laughs> to people that, that say i don't have time <laughs> well that is the most common thing that our faculty is saying they do not have the time and so this this um actually this oer award grant um it stipulates there that this is over and above, you know, and beyond. So it's like, um, it doesn't, we're not giving you a reassigned time. We are not um, giving you um, a sabbatical to do a, an, an OER. However, we have a lot of our full-time faculty in the last um, year or so who have taken sabbatical for the purposes of um, writing an OER. So, and we have three of that already and one is in sabbatical now, but then a lot of our faculty are adjuncts. So um, yes, they don't have the time, but they are committed to making it work for our students. So, and the thing is we give them enough of a leeway so that what they, so that they don't have to, to, to implement it right away. So for example, our first round of OER awardees, which we um, uh, informed December of last year, they wouldn't have to teach the course using that OER until fall 2018. So that gives them you know, ample time to, especially if they're revising and remixing and creating a new resource, to to, to, to not be um, constrained by the, 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 the time. So we built in enough of, of time for them to, to accomplish the project. So for our second round of grantees, which um, we've um, named uh, January, yeah, January, no, that was like February, first week of February, they don't have to teach the course until spring 2019. Great. So people that kind of dip their toe in the OER world where mm -hmm. maybe they don't have resources for their whole course, but mm -hmm. for a few modules or 
do you, do you see kind of a, a, a difference in terms of how people go up, take their path? Is it some people just kind of get started on a few modules and then expand or is it really full course adop adoption? It was full. It was really? full. Yeah. And, and for the last, so from fall 2015 up until this semester, we didn't have any, any um, OER award. We didn't have any faculty incentives. So it was just like the faculty are just really committed to um, to to making a difference to their students, especially those faculty whose textbooks really really are expensive. That was their motivation, um, especially when they hear you know the 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 feedback from our from our students. I cannot, in good conscience, they say one of our biology faculty um, teaching um, human anatomy, I cannot, in good conscience, assign a $250 textbook for my students. Right. And so um, he did use an OER. He used um, OpenStax. Um, but he is still uh, using a lab manual. The lab manual um, costs $70. But from two hundred fifty to seventy dollars, that was like you know a savings. So his goal is to create his own lab manual so that our students don't have to pay that seventy dollar lab manual. So yeah. So yes, they are all in. There's no yeah. partial. <laughs> <laughs> I like your style. Yeah. Um, we have another great question from Susan here, where she. Um, is curious if you have a range as to how many hours it takes to build a three credit course with OER. Um, I really don't. I really don't have like a prescribed amount of time just because it differs according to faculty. You know, some faculty really are very savvy. Some are very fast. You know, they, so I, I really don't have um, like a prescribed time, but it also depends on whether that faculty is just adopting an existing OER or revising and remixing two or more OER. Of course, um, if you are revising and remixing multiple OERs, that would take a lot of time versus just adopting um, an already existing OER. You know, one thing that probably you need to take a look at is this. Um, so if you, I, I can't. So if you um, Google library as open education leaders, um, there's this report that was, um, it came out January of this year. So this one was written by Quill, Wes, and Amy Hoffer. This was, um, this is, this study is unique and I recommend, you know, you reading it because it, it kind of details the time that it takes for a faculty to um, create a course using OER. So, you know, just to just give you an idea. So it's, um, let me see, it's library as open education leaders. If I can, uh, let's see. And I, I can I can try to find it too. Um, yeah. Who, who did you because that about? one, um, I think that study is unique because each of the faculty participating in that grant was required to um, have um, their own journal that details, you know, what were you doing and how much time did it involve for you to do the curation, to do the revision, to do this and that. And so it just gives you an idea. And that's um, with Amy Hoffer from um, Oregon? Open Is Oregon, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I found it. I'll put it in the chat for everybody. Okay, so yeah. Well. So I think that the time itself, I, I, I don't think that we can um, have like a definitive time that would be applicable to, to uh, you know, across all faculty, just because each course is different and each faculty is different. But what I can tell is that um, adoption is clearly as less time consuming as when you're, of course, creating a new OER or revising and remixing multiple OER. And uh, Regina, you mentioned how you have really reached out to folks outside of 
your education community in Michigan for support in, in OER. Did you find faculty doing the same or did they really kind of find the supports they needed within the campus or within the state? Actually, yes, they, they've reached out and um, we have a number of our faculty who are very active on Twitter. Um, they're in the CCC OER um, listserv. Um, they are participating in in that forum and um, a lot of our faculty especially the ones who are the creators of open open textbook they get a lot of emails from um, faculty who adopted their their um, their open textbook and I get that a lot too because they CC me every time they get those feedback from from faculty um, and so it kind of like gives them the 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 you know, motivation to do more because they are being recognized by not just faculty from community colleges, but also faculty from the four year um, colleges. I mean, I am so proud of our faculty because um, while, while they understand that OER is a lot of work, they they are also very cognizant of the push for our students to succeed. And so they have this mentality that this is one thing that I can control, the, the things that I assigned, you know, the textbook that I assigned in class. And so I would want it to be about equity and social justice. So, um, yeah, and, and that's the, the thing that I've always um, relied on you know, those faculty who would be champions and um, with the hope that they influence their um, faculty colleagues. If the other faculty sees the success that they are having with using OER, probably the other faculty would also be enticed to, um, to use that in their courses, so. That's great. And you mentioned equity and we're hearing more and more, you know, how OER can support uh, equity not only with access and obviously you know affordability uh, for students but also around relevancy and inclusion and in terms of thinking about accessibility and incorporating diverse you know um, uh, research and expertise and also really making these personalized learning opportunities for students in Michigan have you seen uh, that really play out in terms of uh, OER meeting some of the equity needs beyond access and affordability for your students? Um, it's definitely access and affordability. And um, we, as, in, in our um, future research, we want to tease that out even more. Um, I want to know how many of our students, specifically those uh, that are on Pell Grants, are really benefiting from our OER um, initiative. How many are from, um, you know, the underrepresented groups? How many are from, you know, the working, like the, the 50 and above, the returning adults, um, African Americans? Um, you know, that one, we, we are still planning to tease that out so that um, we know that we are making a difference in terms of those um, marginalized groups. Great. And we have a, another question here from Jane, um, who uh, is curious what uh, workshops you offer to faculty and, and how much time uh, does faculty typically spend on training? Um, I, do the, I do a lot of the trainings for faculty. Um, so it's usually um, in our Center for Teaching Excellence. It's one and a half hours of training. So um, so, you know, I do the OER basics um, and that's kind of like a rolling, you know, every semester I do that. Um, OER workflows, that is new, that I just um, started this semester. And uh, for our OER award uh, grantees, we have a kickoff training for them that I do so that they know what they need to do in terms of um, the requirements of the grant and what they need to turn in. Um, I have two additional um, sessions that I am doing um, this spring semester on Creative Commons licensing and copyright, um, just because I am part of the cohort, the beta cohort for the Creative Commons 
common certificate for librarians. So hopefully, um, we're on our eighth week now, and uh, it's a 12-week course, and it's facilitated by the David Wiley. When that um, course is rolled out after our beta version, I, I encourage you um, to attend that. There's three modules, Creative Commons Certificate for Librarians, Creative Commons Certificate for Educators, and Creative Commons Certificate for Government. So, yeah, so those are the two. And then there's also faculty um, who are doing the open pedagogy workshop training for our faculty, so. That's great. And we're seeing more and more really the schools um, and campuses um, really take the leadership on the training, which mm -hmm. is really inspiring to me to see uh, you know, that leadership come from the schools and campuses themselves. Yeah. And I see that as just, you know, from, from a support, you know, we're nonprofit, you know, support and, and training point of view. I see that as really sustainable um, for folks to, to get that leadership. And, and I just want to um, say as well for maybe some of you that don't have, um, you know, that kind of training support on your campus or schools. That is something that we offer uh, here at ISKME as part of, you know, our OER services. And, you know, this webinar series is, is, is part of that. And we offer we uh, free webinars throughout the school year and, and um, other training supports as well. So um, would love to have further conversations with folks if you um, need support there. And we do everything from like road mapping to really, you know, planning goals and priorities for the year to the nitty gritty of, you know, nuts and bolts of, you know, how, what um, open educational practice really looks like and how you can support um, curation and authoring and, and things like that. Um, may, can we have a, excuse me, May, I just wanted to um, address this question from Rick. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, he asked what kind of things have publishers done in response to your move towards OER? Oh my, they are really very active. I, I cannot tell you how many publishers I have talked to come to me directly. Just the other day, Macmillan is in my office, Engage, Pearson. Um, you know, I am not, I would like to find a way um, of working with them, but at this point, I think um, they don't know what they're selling. So, and that's what I am telling them. You know, it is not the content you are selling because the content itself is free. You are selling the platform. And until you are honest with us um, about it, you know, I, I, yeah. So anyways, yes, they are reaching out, not just to me, but to our faculty too, individually. They are meeting with them. And the good thing about um, our faculty is if, um, you know, they get an offer, say, for example, from Cengage, oh, from, from like uh, 250, now you can have all access to the e-version and all these ancillaries for $100. So, you know, they tell me, Reggie, I said, you know, it's, it is still up to you because I am not going to tell you what is best for you and your students. It's still up to the faculty, whether the faculty wants to use use the publisher platform or use an OER, it's up to them. So, um, and he also ha asked, how did the 500,000 budget come to be? So, <laughs> actually, I have been advocating for um, our administration to um, support our faculty in terms of grants and incentives. And when our vice president for finance um, came to me last um, end of summer and says, you know, Regina, our president is ready. Um, I think he has a figure in mind for the OER incentive that you were asking. Um, it's been, it's between 200,000 to 500,000. And of course, I said, well, 500,000 would be good to start with. So <laughs> that was how it came to be. And it was from our general fund. And I don't have any deadline as to how, um, when I can spend it. So it can just roll um, over to the next fiscal year. And I am in charge of that award and I also chair the OER award committee. So. 
Thank you, Regina. We're coming up on the um, hour. So um, just wanted to say a huge thank you to Regina and also to let folks know that our next storytelling uh, session will be March 20th at 12 p.m. And I actually see that Evan, our next um, storyteller, uh, is on the, on, the, um, on the call. So Evan, I don't know if you want to say say hi I can introduce you quickly but um, Evan is the program director at area education agencies of Iowa um, professional learning and he has um, been leading the great work that they're doing across the state of Iowa um, and so we're really looking forward to hearing his story he's been inspiring other states that we work with um, Ann Baum, who's another one of our speakers um, in Pennsylvania, actually reached out to Evan um, on her own to, to get some information about how, how his OER initiative was going to help inspire the work that they're doing. So um, he's, he's inspired uh, lots of folks already, and we're really thrilled to have him join us on March 20th at noon Pacific time to share his story. So Evan, I don't know if you're still there, but if you want to just say a quick hey. <laughs> Be nice to hear your uh, well, voice. Hey. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, for the introduction, um, and I look forward to visiting with everybody in a couple weeks. Wonderful, great. We look forward to it. And um, yeah, uh, Regina is um, she, actually Regina. You just sent that to me privately, so I'll put it in the group chat. Oh, okay. But Regina um, is very. Uh, contactable, <laughs> uh, very, very uh, connectable uh, in the yes. world. Uh, you can find her uh, really active on Twitter. If you don't follow her yet, you certainly should at Dr. Gong, um, sharing her, her, her great work and advocacy. And then she included her um, email there too, if you'd like to reach out to her directly. And I included mine in the chat as well, Megan at ISME. Dot org if you have any questions about the series or uh, our training services or our OER services uh, would be really happy to uh, have any discussions with folks uh, to help your thinking in terms of uh, rolling out your OER work so uh, thanks again everyone for joining and we hope that you will invite others and, and join us again on March 20th and um, this is a series of five so uh, we'll have uh, representatives from um, Iowa, uh, Pennsylvania, Washington, and Vermont in this series sharing their stories and all different perspectives from you know the very top policy makers to instructional designers um, and everywhere in between so I uh, really hope you can join us for this series. And thanks again, Regina, for sharing your super inspiring story. <laughs> and can't wait to see, reach your goals and, and see what's next. Um, yeah, so. thank you. Thank you, Megan, for asking me to be part of this. And thank you, everyone, for your time.